from Kyrie to Joe Burrow to Philly B in the Philosophy Podcast, my next guest. He's the voice of the Brooklyn Nets. He is CBS Sports. If you watched Joe Burrow throughout the whole entire playoffs, you know who he is. If you watch the NFL on CBS, you know who he is. If you watch basketball, you know who my next guest is, the voice of the Brooklyn Nets. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ian Eagle, what a great podcast we got. I'm taking up too much time. Let's go. Go get them. Okay, so everybody just heard our great opening monologue, and I'm so excited to have this amazing guest, Ian Eagle, the voice of the Brooklyn Nets, CBS. Crazy month for month for you. You've got everything going on with the Nets. Uh, you've watched Joe Burrow in the playoffs in person. <laughs> We've yeah. listened to you talk about Joe Burrow. Uh, so it's an honor to have you on. But right away, big breaking news today coming out of uh, New York City. Uh, Mayor Adams talking about the now the – vaccines, um, the mandatory things, a lot of things could change. And I could really change the Nets' future right now. So what's going on on your guys' side over at Brooklyn? Well, it's a waiting game. Uh, I think uh, a lot of it is based on the optics for New York. Uh, they don't want to jump the gun. They want to do it based on the timing in regards to science. And uh, although every other city, major city in America, has already made the change and the exceptions were in place in regards to professional athletes. You know, there's a little bit more to this story, Phil, because it was the previous mayor and his office, Mayor de Blasio, that made the decision in regards to New York City in particular, Boston, similar mandate, Chicago, similar mandate, LA, similar mandate, but there were exceptions in place for professional athletes. So, this season in Brooklyn, we've had a number of teams come in that have had unvaccinated players, but nobody cared, knew. It basically went unreported because it was allowed. This is where things get a little bit tricky. Kyrie Irving was not allowed to play because he was considered a New York resident and worker. So uh, the hope is this will change moving forward. I believe the team is hoping that it's going to happen within the next two to three weeks, but who knows? It's really up to the discretion of the mayor's office right now. Yeah. I mean, back to that, you have players coming in that are unvaccinated. I know, I mean, going to games and stuff and uh, sit right by the players, you have to be vaccinated and then you have to test on the game day. But then meanwhile, you're not even that close to them, but they're playing with guys out on the court who aren't even vaccinated, who are traveling on airplanes with their team in Correct. different states. So, all these rules that we've been seeing this year, it's really confusing. And uh, I'm kind of shocked that the NBA didn't really uh, hit this on the head more. I think that the NFL, uh, from another question for you, is probably taking a lot of scrutiny. When you look back at the Super Bowl, uh, they have the giant mask mandate out in L.A. And you look and you see uh, the commissioner, you see all these ath uh, athletes and celebrities that are there. No masks, no nothing. Uh, from your perspective, because in your job, I remember I was watching an interview and you were talking about last year uh, – you guys couldn't interact with your own coworkers, see the players. Correct. What are your feelings about uh, the Super Bowl in, in that aspect from what you guys had to go through? And then that it was kind of just like a free palooza. Yeah, I think, look, there are best laid plans, as we know, in society. Uh, you can put forth a, a philosophy of what it is you want to do, but group mentality is very different. So individually, you can police it. If you're the NFL, you can tell a media member you cannot go into the press box without a mask, and odds are they're going to abide by it. But when a fan is paying as much money as they were paying to get in, and they look around and notice that nobody's wearing a mask, that's where their strength in numbers. How are they possibly going to police it? So I think they said the right things with the idea that, hey, it's California. Things are a little tighter there. Phil, I traveled around the country during the pandemic. And I live in New Jersey. And I'm not talking about this past season. I'm talking about last season before vaccines. And the difference from city to city was shocking. Uh, there was no steadfast rule. It was based on the geography. If I was in Nashville, we were not interacting with people on our broadcast. I was not allowed to even see my analyst until game day. And we would be brought to the stadium in separate cars. This was based on a network trying to protect their workers and also 
uh, trying to avoid having someone get stuck in a city because they've tested positive for COVID. But if you then went into a restaurant to pick up food, literally, I would be the only one in a mask. So a lot of mixed messages. There's no doubt that uh, we're hopefully getting through it and past it and getting back to some form of normalcy. Uh, look, I'm a rule follower by general. I want to I want to be able to do the games. That's the way I always viewed it. And I'm fortunate. I work for CBS, yes, TNT, Westwood One. If I tested positive for COVID, that would knock me out of potentially four jobs in a week. I've taken 180 tests from wow. the NBA bubble to today. And I'm very fortunate, knock on wood, I went 180 and 0. And my goal is to remain undefeated. So winners win. When that's it. it. I mean, that's the mentality. The only way to work is to continue to test negative. So right. that's been my focal point throughout. What was the best part and probably the worst part talking about bubble life? In the NBA bubble? I, I, I think the best part was the fact that sports was back. If you remember, it came at a time where we were thirsting for some kind of competition and the players were into it. That's the part I didn't know. When I showed up there, would the players be engaged or would this be filler until they just got out of there and went about their their merry way? And the reality was they played hard. The guys took it seriously and the games were fun. It was spirited. So that to me was the biggest positive, just getting back to the action. Yeah, the negative was being in isolation and the very odd nature of that. We could interact with other people that were staying at the hotel. So I ended up getting a chance to catch up with people that I don't normally see over the course of, of a season. Mike Breen and Kevin Harlan, Dave Pash, other broadcasters that were there. It was awesome. You know, we had lunch outside, socially distanced, but it was amazing just to kind of get back into that mindset. Remember, this was going back to, for me, late July, early August of 2020. And things have changed since then. The worst part, as mentioned, was just the odd nature of all of it. I was away from home for 21 straight days. Look, I can deal with that. I've done Olympics. I've done the French Open. I've done events that take a while but I had gotten so used to sleeping in my own bed. Right. It was a little bit bizarre to get back into that mindset of, of being on the road again. Right. So, all right, let's go to some more uh, happy topics besides the bubble. I mean, what a crazy NFL season that just ended. Maybe one of the most electric playoffs I think I've ever watched. I remember we were watching the Kansas city chiefs game. I live bet the bills, terrible decision that I made. <laughs> it was so bad. My dad goes, Oh, it's over. And I go, Oh, Patrick Mahomes is 13 seconds left. I go, they're going to win. Then we're going to see uh, TikToks all week. And then Joe Burrow is going to come in. Yeah. You witnessed live. And you you were the voice behind every single one of his epic highlights. Explain to us what that was like watching Joe Burrow in the playoffs. Because you know everybody watched him in college. But a lot of college quarterbacks, once they get to the NFL, they go yeah. through a terrible period of time. Like Daniel Jones in New York you know, didn't have the right setting and now is fighting for his career. When you look at a guy like Joe Burrow, calling him in person. What is that like? What is the uh, effect it has on you for your pr prep? Because you know how many people are watching for Joe Burrow. Yeah, Phil, the thing that, that strikes me the most is presence. The guy has a certain presence about him. And that's an intangible quality. When you're scouting a player, you're going through the tape, you're pouring through every play that he had, literally every play that he ran collegiately. Uh, you get your hands on whatever you can in order to do your due diligence to find out about the player. The part that you can't quite know is desire because every guy's going to say all the right things. This is his dream. He wants to be a leader. He wants to be a hall of famer. He wants to be a Super Bowl champion. So that's the first part. It's hard to gauge. You can only take their word for it or talk to those that know him best. And then the second part is just an overall presence. When you put that person in the locker room, how do his teammates respond to him? 
And what's the respect level in that locker room? Do they follow him? Is he a natural leader? And is he a problem solver? All these things you don't know until he's in live action in the NFL. The tape doesn't always translate, as we know. Right. So here's how I would look at it with him. Chip on his shoulder, built in. Gets to Ohio State, basically told, look, you're not good enough to start. You're talented, but we've got guys that are more talented. So instead of playing for his hometown school, the school that he dreamed of playing for, he's got to pick up, he's got to transfer, he goes down south to LSU and the SEC, and what does he do? He wins a national championship. He wins the Heisman Trophy. He's the number one overall pick. So right there, he's already proven people wrong, people in the state of Ohio, people that were making those decisions. Now he's told you're going to the Cincinnati Bengals. They tell him, look, this is going to be like a six year process. This is a franchise that can't get out of its own way. They're not prepared for this. Yeah. You're a number one pick, but it's a bad offensive line. It's going to take time. And he takes it all in and says, uh-huh. Okay. Sure. He has no problem going to Cincinnati. Everybody is baiting him trying to get him to say, He's wearing I don't want to be like there. This. Yeah. He's just doing it his way. And I, the way I sensed it, he was absorbing all of it. Okay, so he comes out. Rookie year, you can see moments. There are flashes where you say to yourself, man, this guy's, this guy's a player. You know, they're not winning a lot, but there's highlights and there's moments where you can see the foundation and then the leg injury. And you go, oh, man, this guy's going to go back to square one. He's going to have to wear a brace on his, on his knee. He's not going to be able to do those Joe Burrow type things. And what happens? He comes back year two. He's better. He's more polished. He's everything you hoped he would be. And then I didn't get a chance to meet him his rookie year. I, I just didn't have any Bengals games. I wasn't assigned any. Got him a bunch this past season, radio and TV, and then met him for the first time. I was like, oh, man. This guy is very direct and pretty confident dude, borderline cocky in a good way. And I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked by any of this. You could just tell that he has that it factor and it played out time and time again in big pressure playoff moments. What was your biggest takeaway probably from talking with him uh, before games and the things that he would say? Uh, you could just sense that, uh, none of this was too big. None of it seemed overwhelming. And look, I've been doing the NFL now at the network level for 24 years. Right. So any quarterback during that time that you can think of, I've spoken to. I've been in his company. I've been in his presence. We've done production meetings. And that ranges from late in his career, Dan Marino, to Peyton Manning, literally at the beginning of his career, his first career game in the NFL was my first game for CBS. And it was Indianapolis against Miami. It was Peyton Manning and Dan Marino. And I remember Manning walking into the production meeting. I don't know what to expect. This is 1998, September of 98. And he knows my name right out of the gate, which means he's well-schooled. He asked the PR director, hey, who am I talking to? Oh, Ian Eagle and Mark May? Great. Extends his hand. Hey, Ian, Peyton Manning, like, oh man, like this guy <laughs> is ready. And then I was blown away by his knowledge in that game. He threw a couple of picks. They lost the game to Miami. They went three and 13 in his rookie year. I had them, I think five times that year. So I saw him a lot and I couldn't believe how polished he was. And there was a presence. You knew this guy was going to be successful. And I would say the same thing about Joe Burrow, uh, just, the way he talked about his teammates, uh, very confident in, in his thought process, never wavering on that. And then, you know, second, third meeting, maybe a little bit more levity, a little bit of a sense of humor. He's pretty, pretty stoic. Like you try to crack that veneer. I know deep down there's a lot more there, but I'm sure he's put up a front in doing these interviews. But you could tell each time, yeah, you know, we were breaking through a little bit more. So, yeah, I think he's the complete package. 
is there ever a time when you you're calling a game? Are you ever? How do you not like root for a certain player or a certain team? Does that ever <laughs> come up? Because like you watch like some of these guys. Uh, for instance, uh, guys like Michael K. He's gonna go to Sunday Night Baseball. You know, when the Yankees play on Sunday Night Baseball, who he's rooting for. For you, uh, same thing. You know, with the Nets, when you call the Nets games, are you fully rooting for the Nets? Uh, same thing with the NFL. Do you ever pull for a certain team over the other? Sometimes. I really do not. Uh, the second I got the job at the network level, I recognized what the job entailed. And that meant being impartial and understanding that your audience is very different. If I'm doing a net game on yes, I know pretty much who the audience is. And now with NBA League Pass and illegal streams, whatever else is out there, you know there are other people watching. But for the most part, your audience, your core group are net fans. When you're doing a national game, if I'm doing the Ravens and the Chargers, I know I have Ravens fans watching. I know I have Chargers fans watching. I know I have general NFL fans, fantasy football players. I know I have gamblers watching. I know I then have degenerate gamblers. You have that next level yeah. of gamblers. And now your audience is very sorted. So the broadcast, you have to serve a number of masters and you have to recognize that your job is to be objective in those moments. And even if I know a coach, a player, I've met with them many times, or I consider someone a friend, I don't know. Once I put that headset on, I, I can separate that completely. I really can. And, and I've been able to do it maybe because I got the job at a young age and I didn't have bad habits. I just knew that that was par for the course. So to answer your question in the most circuitous way possible, no, I, I never, I never find myself in the moment rooting for specific players and teams. There are moments with my fantasy football team where maybe I give it a little extra juice on a touchdown, but you know, that between me and, and the guys that I play fantasy football with. <laughs> So uh, before we exit out of the NF of NFL topics, the Super Bowl ended. A very controversial final drive uh, for the Rams. What are your thoughts on that final PI call on Cooper Cup that really had a lot of people shocked? I myself was very upset about it. I felt that the game was almost rigged at the end because it was in L.A. And I wouldn't say it was rigged, but it definitely, I feel like, gave sports fans that thought because, again, it wasn't really a good pass interference call. It was for the Rams in L.A. at the Super Bowl in their new stadium. Phil, I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist guy. I don't believe for a moment that anybody with the NFL, anybody on the officiating crew is thinking in those terms in that moment. I mean, that that would require a lot of conversation prior to the game of how we're going to do this and let's do that and let's I don't think it's happening. I don't. Maybe I just want to believe that uh, the world is good and that's how I need to go through life. I don't know. That never struck me for a moment, for a second, that the game would be rigged. But I understand there's a faction of people that, that may believe that. There are certainly people that gamble on the game that now allow their minds to play tricks on them because they believe that the world is against them in some manner. It's not a healthy way to go through life. That would be right. my two cents. But again, uh, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Yeah. Well, again, I need to do what I need to do to go through life. I go right. through life as an optimistic person, as someone that is kind to people, uh, someone that's approachable, like you approached me in Brooklyn. Yep. That's how I go through life. That's not that day I d decided, yeah, I'll just... Uh, I'll just be open and uh, honest with someone that, that approaches me. That's every day. So right. I don't want to believe that. Was it a good call? I don't want to believe that either. I don't think it was a good call. In the moment, I did not believe it was a good call. Does it completely change everything? Who knows? We're speculating. Right. Exactly. Would they have not uh, somehow gotten it done? I, I don't know. You know, that's the mystery of sports. That's why we all keep coming back. We turn the game on because we don't know. We think we know. But we, don't. we have an idea of what's going to happen. Las Vegas puts down odds. This could happen. That could happen. 
the reality is we don't know what's going to happen. I thought Cincinnati, they played well. Uh, they played nearly well enough to win. The play calling at the end, a little shaky. It was bad. I, I didn't. I thought that uh, you have two weeks to prepare for that game, and sometimes you really look at uh, it does come down to the coaching. I think that Sean McFay, they had a chance a lot of times in that game to uh, just go for the kill, and they didn't take the kill. They tried to get a little too cute with all the play calls. Um, the Cincinnati side, they knew they weren't going to have a whole lot of time, so I was shocked we didn't see a lot more screens. I mean, when Aaron Donald's not out there, that's when they should be running the ball, not running it at Aaron Donald when he's Yeah, out. and running it with Samaj P. Ryan, exactly. who ended up getting the biggest play of the game in in his hands and, and couldn't do anything with it. So in the end, we had a highly competitive game, memorable game. Is it a classic? No, I, I wouldn't put it in yeah. that category. Was it intriguing and did it maintain my interest from start to finish? 100%. And did it cap off a, a really fun and uh, unpredictable NFL season? It did. Uh, I thought the NFL had a terrific year from start to finish. No dominant team emerged. To me, Buffalo looked like the best team. And they came within an eyelash of maybe showing it by advancing to the AFC championship and then potentially advancing to the Super Bowl and maybe even winning a Super Bowl. You think that they're going to change the overtime rule? I don't know. I don't think they'll succumb based on this circumstance this year. We've seen these situations before, and the reality is they haven't changed it before. But I do think the NFL is open to whatever is best for the game. And there was a lot of pushback. I don't know if there's any one specific way to make it better all the time. Would you like the idea that a team has to touch it? Yeah. I would also like the idea for Buffalo to stop Kansas city. Exactly. I mean, and not allow a touchdown. Like, at some point, they're in a prevent defense. Correct. Up by that three. Was completely misplayed. And at some point it's the totality of your team. It's offense, defense, special teams. So everybody just locks in on, well, the offense didn't get a chance to touch the ball. Yes, defense but the defense was given a chance to make a play. If they knock the ball free from Patrick Mahomes and run it in for a touchdown, guess what? Game over. Exactly. Kansas City doesn't get another chance to match it. So I don't know. Things are very convenient for the moment, and I understood that was a tremendous game, truly. And for it to end that way felt a little bit unfulfilling. And that's why you get the reaction that you get. Yep. I'm going to go to my next part of the show. We're going to go some rapid fire questions real quick. I've got six of them. Uh, your pregame ritual. <laughs> uh, pregame ritual. I tend to have a Pepsi or Coke before every game. Not supposed to be drinking soda. My wife is not a fan and... I already have something about the soda coming up in the later of the show, though. Yeah, I have a little bit of an addictive personality, so <laughs> I I like soda, and I try to avoid it. But before a game, I don't drink coffee. I've never had a sip of coffee, so actually, somehow, actually, no, never had. Is Starbucks King. I'm addicted. I'm addicted. See, that's you. I'm I'm out. Never had a sip. So somehow, mentally, I believe that replaces it for me. It gives me a little little juice. I think it does nothing, but mentally I'm convinced it does something. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Joe Burrow or Patrick Mahomes? Ooh. <sighs> Mahomes is hard to go against given his raw ability. I do think teams have started to figure it out a little bit. And Kansas City, you want to talk about getting cute? That's a team that's tried to get a little too cute offensively instead of figuring out the bread and butter. They did not run the football nearly effectively enough and balance it out. But if I have to start a team today, I'm still starting with Patrick Mahomes. Would you rather call game seven of the NBA finals or Don't. game seven or mm. game seven, Philadelphia versus Brooklyn? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let's see the one that's more feasible for me. What's attainable right now? Mike Breen is going nowhere. So right. the second option is actually possible. So I will say 
option number two because it's it's not abstract. It it's potentially real. Real quick, let me just take a break from this real quick. Uh, when you look at um, speaking about James Harden, from what I see from a fan's perspective, but from a broadcaster's perspective, dealing with both players, the NFL, the players really don't complain too much when they're not winning. Like they'll complain about certain things that happen. But in the NBA, once they start to lose, why do they panic so much more and then go out and create these super teams or start cutting each other's heads off like uh, in Brooklyn, James Harden, gone out the door after two weeks later saying we're not going to trade him? What's the difference? I think it's twofold. One, NBA, as an individual, you have more power than you do as an individual in the NFL. Quarterbacks have a lot of power. We understand that. But – to build a winner in the NFL, it requires team. And that means having excellent players at every level. You don't win without Aaron Donald. Stafford was great. Cooper Cup, great in the fourth quarter. If Aaron Donald does not make those plays, there's a pretty good chance the Cincinnati Bengals are world champions. Right. So I just think that with NBA players, things turned at some point. You know, whether it be seven years ago, 10 years ago, in that general range where the star players recognized they had a lot of power. Shaquille O'Neal wanted out of Orlando. He got out. You know, he signed as a free agent with the Lakers. Right. Everyone thought, oh, Shaq's going to be a magic forever. No, he had other interests beyond the NBA. He thought going to L.A. was going to help his brand. And he was right, by the way. Everything he did was correct. Now, there were those, I guarantee you, if you look back on that time, we didn't have first take, we didn't have debate shows, we didn't have the internet at the level that we have it now with social media and Twitter, but the reaction was negative. M mistake by Shaq. He should stay. He should win it in Orlando. Finish what you started. Well, that's now a distant memory. He goes to the Lakers. He teams up with Kobe Bryant. We know the rest is history. And he becomes a megastar. Movies, TV, music, reality TV. He's, he's crushed it. So that's someone who recognized his power. He doesn't get the same criticism, though, that others have gotten. Kevin Durant got when he went to Golden State and joined a winner and eventually won a couple of championships. I think the second part of the equation is when someone pairs up, it's hard as a superstar to stay stagnant. Damian Lillard is now getting criticism the other way for not pairing up. You know, that's that's the incredible part. Lillard has stayed in Portland. He wants to win it with the team that drafted him. He wants to remain a fixture in that community. And there are those within NBA circles that says, ah, this guy doesn't really want to compete. He doesn't want to play for a championship. You can't have it both ways. Right. And I think people tend to do that. The Harden situation in particular, Phil, look, it became untenable. And if a player shuts down and doesn't want to be there, you can say all the right things. You could send teammates his way. You could send coaches his way. You could send the general manager his way. You could send ownership his way. It doesn't matter if he's already disengaged, which James had done. You can't get it back. The genie's out of the bottle. So did he come out and say it? No, but he didn't have to. Anyone around the team recognized he just didn't want to be there anymore wanted to be in philadelphia daryl morey wanted him there and they consummated a deal have you ever been starstruck at a game before because i know the game we were at there wasn't a lot of celebrities there but there was one guy that was there after making headlines in the nfl after running off the field antonio brown have you ever been starstruck <laughs> in the game? no uh, i've never been starstruck in my life which is pretty crazy my my parents were entertainers. My father was a stand-up comedian, an actor, a musician. My mother was an actress and a singer. So I grew up around it, and none of it ever seemed overwhelming or out of reach. And maybe that was part of the reason why. So no, meeting 
people that are celebrities, stars, athletes, actors, musicians. No, I've never, never been starstruck. If it came down and you could only uh, announce the game with one person on your staff, would it be Richard Jefferson oh, or Sarah? Don't, don't, don't do that. Okay, don't, I won't. Don't feel. I mean, it would be Sarah, but don't. Don't, okay. don't do I was I was at the game. I'll tell you what, it's hysterical. You're like the cool dad out of the group. She's the good, she's the good daughter. And Richard Jefferson, like you're just waiting for him to get in trouble. Like he yep. comes out, he's got the shirt on button, high five, and <laughs> talking about everybody. You then you come walking out, hi everybody. We talked after I was talked to Richard yeah. Jefferson. It's like you're the cool dad, and you're just waiting for when he gets back over there still like yelling. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. See? That's that's how I always look at that. You know what? In all seriousness, Phil, the the cool thing for me has been seeing Richard's evolution because I was doing the Nets when Richard was a rookie, and Richard was a smart ass, sarcastic son of a bitch, and funny as hell. Like I I liked his humor. I dug his humor. He would rub some people the wrong way because he was harsh and direct and had no awesome. filter, none. And he had no resume to back it up. Now, Richard became a very good player, as we know, won a championship with Cleveland, uh, but was an excellent player in his own right. And when he decided to enter the media, I knew he would be really good because he's talented and he's got a fresh point of view and he's very comfortable on camera in front of a microphone. He's always been that way. The question was whether or not you could harness all that and he would be able to do it on a mainstream level. And the reality is he can, he can do both. He can go beyond because he is a pisser and is hilarious. And then when you need him to just analyze the game and talk about what he sees, he's very insightful. He's been around this league a long time. He's played with a lot of different guys. He's played for a bunch of different coaches. So he's, uh, he's a, a special talent. But if you're telling me I can only spend time with one or the other, I got, I got to go with Sarah. She's exceptionally talented. She's a fantastic person. She lights up the room when she walks in and she's a pleasant human being. So if it's a deserted Island, this is not even a question. I always see you guys every, uh, whenever you guys do a game, you guys always take a group photo. Is there like a, a good luck charm to that before the games? No, it's it's simply to feed the beast, which is Sarah's social media accounts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if- I I certainly do not require a photo beforehand. I uh, I'm a good teammate, and you know Sarah believes that my presence in the photo helps the number of likes. So I'm all in. I like it. If you had to pick one of the two jackets behind me to wear at a game, which one would it be? I mean the. The safari print is going to make a larger statement. Well, no I was doubt. running during a game. I was late for the second period, and I was running up to the camera. I looked like I was being hunted by people. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you would have to be very careful in certain parts of the country exactly. that you would not be harpooned in some way. So I in New York, to... you're good. Right. In some other parts, leave not it in the sure. closet. I might have to wear it to the next Nets game that I go to. I'm not sure <laughs> I like it. Dude, I, I wouldn't put it past you. So uh, I'll, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm certainly not challenging you. You, of your free and own accord, do what you got to do. I, I don't. Do I don't see you as a shy human being. So no, not you can all. handle it. I I pulled out the full Joe Burrow look. Uh, the game after uh, we had Joe Burrow, I put the hat. Dude, on. he's got he's got legit swag. Like we, oh, it's crazy. We had a road game. I think they were in Vegas, Cincinnati at Las Vegas. And he came out in an ensemble that I'm not sure any NFL player would have worn. And he was cool with it. And we asked him about it. He's like, yeah. And it's funny with him. He answers questions in a way you ask. And his first reaction is always, yeah. So he kind of gives you the, yeah. So he said, the outfit, anything behind it? He's like, just comfortable. That's, That's great. It. No What's backstory. That? That's it. Favorite game you ever called? Yeah, hard to say. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's some on a personal level that are different than than the larger scale ones. You know, for the for the NBA Finals, I did 
the world feed for a number of years. So that was going to countries outside of the U.S., awesome. English speaking countries. So the United Kingdom and Australia, Israel, uh, Indonesia. I'm huge in Indonesia. You know, I can't I can't walk the streets of Indonesia Pretty without eagle. a crowd. Yeah. So Michael Jordan against the Utah Jazz. Jordan, the shot over Brian Russell, his last game as a Chicago Bull. I did that game That's and awesome. it was fantastic. I did the I, Duke Butler championship game on the world feed, similar situation. Hayward missing at the buzzer from half court. Tremendous game. Some football games that uh, I I think are, are top notch, come from behind wins. Ben Roethlisberger, heroics, Tom Brady, last second victories for the Pats. Yeah. Peyton Manning during that run. Not only in New England uh, with Indy, but in Denver as well. So I've been really fortunate. I'd like to say, though, Phil, I don't think I've called it yet. There's a game somewhere down the road, NCAA Tom tournament, Brady's comeback game, NFL. Who knows? Back? Yeah, maybe. Think he's coming back. Know. I know you have a good Tom Brady story for us. I read about it. Yeah, it got more attention than I ever anticipated, to be perfectly honest. But yeah, I mean, it was just a a fun deal where I had a game the night before I got in very early for a production meeting, but I had a fly take like a 6am flight. So I was a mess. And uh, I ended up having Pepsi and a donut as Brady walks into the room. And this guy, as we know, like no sugar, no carbs, no junk food, no soda, no anything, no real ice cream. Oh, it's and, terrible. I and he walks in. Him. Yeah, he walks in. And he just crushes me. He's like, what do you got going on there? And, you know, I'm not I'm not that proud. I'm I'm going to own up. So I was like, yeah, I like donuts and Pepsi. And yes, it's nine in the morning and I'm still doing it. I needed something. You know, again, what I told you earlier, like the Pepsi acts as what I think is a pick me up, then throw a chocolate frosted donut in there like, oh, yeah. Double. I'm getting caffeine every which direction. I'm getting a sugar rush. Uh, so we just had some fun with it. He's a he's a great guy and he's a terrific interview. Uh, he to me through the years, he was really a nice guy. His first year as a starter, I ended up doing a few of their games and he was trying to figure it all out. But by the end, late New England, Tampa Bay, Really a pleasure and incredibly smart, uh, tremendous insight in the game of football. Hey, talking about uh, Michael Jordan real quick. Going to go back and I'll let you go because I know you got to leave soon. Uh, Michael Jordan, you talk about calling his big games. Have you ever uh, smoked a cigar with Michael Jordan before <laughs> after a game? I actually found the guy that rolls his cigars, so I'm trying to order them. If you want to get in on the order with me, we can nice. split it if you want. Uh, I'm not a cigar smoker, but I'd love to see you smoke the cigar in that vest. Maybe. The yeah, the only Jordan story, I have a couple, but the one that comes to mind, my first year doing radio, 1994-95 with the Nets, my broadcast partner was Mike O'Corin, who played for the Nets and also played in North Carolina and was assigned by Dean Smith to be the host for Michael Jordan during his recruiting visit. So he met Jordan when he was still in high school. And he was in charge of showing him around, maybe bringing him to a party, the whole deal, explaining what life is like in Chapel Hill. So as Michael became a superstar, Mike was still friends with him, Michael Corrin. So 96, my son was born. And Mike says to me, Michael Corrin, hey, if you go by those little baby Jordans, when we're in Chicago, I'll bring you back to meet Michael and he'll sign them for you. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm down. So I bought a pair of those baby Jordans. We fly to Chicago. I stick them in my bag. We get there and lo and behold, he brings me to the back. I'm sure you saw it on the last dance. Like you walk through, what felt like catacombs, like one locker room, but then down a hallway through another hallway. And there's Michael. He's just sitting there. He's not dressed for the game yet. He's still in his suit. And he's got those guys around him, those security guards around him. And he brings Mike in. He tells him to come in. I go in with him. He's like, who's this? 
He says, oh, this is High and Eagle broadcaster. He's like, oh, so you've been carrying his ass for all? So he goes right into it, ripping Mike O'Corman. I'm like, yeah, I've been carrying his ass for uh, for all these years. He goes, well, what, what do you need, man? And I said, oh, he's, he's going to have a, a baby. He goes, oh, yeah, you got it. Signs him and still have him. Still, uh, still have him in my possession. So cool moment. The guy couldn't have been more magnanimous and, and nice in the moment. And I've been around him a couple other times since then. Uh, but dude, he was special. It was, I look back now and the idea that I got to call his games, even though they were at the end of his run and I did call Washington games as well. Yeah. That's, that's a career highlight because he, he was truly a, a one of a kind performer. That's awesome. I always ask all my guests before they leave uh, any questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> What does the, the gold chain say? Boom. Boom. So, is that your I, so I what? Is that your nickname? Well, not really. They call me Philly B. That's my that's the nickname that they gave me. Because my last name is Bocaccio. They call me Philly B, but they. Um, yeah. They. Yeah. The pe my fans. You know, you got the, all those the fans, people, so the I, peeps. Yeah. The, the peeps. Uh so I coach uh football, uh baseball, and uh, whenever something good happens, I would always say boom. Like around all my friends, I always say boom. So a lot of good things would happen. I'd say boom, win a couple championships here and there. And it kind of just like stuck. We made like uh, for the podcast, like philosophy and then uh, bracelets like with a uh, boom on them. So uh, one Christmas, my dad goes like, what do you want for Christmas? I'm older now. Like he can't buy me a Nerf gun or like any like. You know, <laughs> I mean, he could, but he could, but he probably weird. would still enjoy it. It would be oh, I weird. I would. Um, and I said to him, I go, I want a boom chain. And he looked at me and he said, are you OK in the head? I go, yeah, I go, I'm good. I go, but I want a boom chain. So he goes, OK. Uh, called up uh, Ranieri Jewelers uh, out in New York City. Nice plug. And, uh, yeah. Went down, uh, had it made, and uh, put it on. I get a lot of hate for it. I only wear it on the podcast and like going out somewhere. No, no hate. No hate but, for uh, me. No hate. No. I mean, the only issue for you is you owe some form of residuals to John Madden. John Madden made boom. Oh my gosh. What I mean, it is we today. That conversation. We watched the thing. I was like, Oh my goodness. I need a new word, but I'm using boom along. No, time. you just, you brought it back. It's, I brought it back. I'm bringing it back. back. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm sure I'll see you around Brooklyn. I'll wear that jacket. Uh, Clyde Frazier loves my jackets whenever I show him <laughs> at the Knicks games. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate you coming on. You got it, man. Next, I got to next time, maybe you break out the cow jacket, like Clyde maybe. the Clyde. Like you that's a, you next me a level. a lot of things uh, that I might have to bring out to Brooklyn when I come next time or next Dude. episode. And if I, if I walk right by you because you're wearing something that's so embarrassing that I yeah. can't even be associated with you, just know now. I okay. Apologize. You got it. Absolutely. So uh, just stick around, everybody. Uh, we'll be right back with uh, No More Bullshit right after the break. Oh, I was allowed to curse this whole time? Shit. Oh, yeah. All right, everybody. Welcome back inside No More Bullshit. Let's talk about it. What's going on in the world today? You always know on No More Bullshit, we cover every single subject that we possibly can. We've done Starbucks. We've done everything. We had a whole episode about Starbucks. But that don't matter right now, okay? Last week, we did the gas and we did inflation. Tonight, we're talking about the Ukraine. What is going on in the Ukraine? Well, it's simple like this. Russia, they're going to be invading Ukraine. They've already started. Everybody's like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe this. Well, it's very believable. Why is Russia doing this now? And why wouldn't they do it under President Trump? Well, because America back then was not weak. We had gas prices that were so low. It was amazing. One dollar for gas. Nobody wanted to mess with us because we were at our strongest point ever. But now that gas is averaging $4 out in California, it's $5. By Memorial Day, gas across the United States will average $5. Can you imagine that? And now when you go to grocery stores, there's no food there either. So just the prices of everything is just going to continue to spike. So why does Russia go into the Ukraine now? Well, because they know that America is weak. When America is weak, the Russians can do whatever they want because we know we're not going to focus that much. Sure. You know what? Let's give the Ukraine who's being invaded, who barely has a military. Let's send them all the tanks that we can. Let's help them. Right. We're going to just do that. Let's trust the Ukraine who are being invaded. Ukraine's the size of Texas, people. If you're being invaded by a bunch of people, by OK, for instance, you're at, you're at your house. There's 5000 people outside coming to invade your house. Your neighbor gives you some guns. They give you whatever. They give you stuff to protect you. 
Aren't you going to probably make a deal with the 1,000 people that are coming in? Take this. Take the money. Take whatever you want. Let me be safe, right? That's what the Ukraine is going to do. Russia doesn't care. Vladimir Putin is already sending troops into the Ukraine right now. Plain and simple. Why? Again, like I said, because he controls so much gasoline through Germany, right? They have this giant pipeline that Germany now they said, well, we're going to shut it down. Well, though, where's the gasoline coming from? Russia. So now Russia's got all this gasoline and everything. What does the United States not have right now besides the president? We don't have gasoline because we shut down the Keystone Pipeline. So now we're using from Canada. We're using from Alaska. Speak about Canada. Look what's happening there with the truckers. Everywhere that we're trying to get gasoline from has an issue right now in the United States. Besides our job numbers that are terrible, but all these other countries have issues going on that we're getting our gas from. Okay, that's all bullshit. And then Joe Biden says, well, Vladimir Putin doesn't want me to be president because he can't walk all over me. He just invaded the Ukraine. He shut down one of our pipelines back in the spring. Remember that? That went from Georgia through South Carolina. You remember that? That's all bullshit. That's been your episode, No More Bullshit. We'll see you next time.